Hey guys, welcome back to Mechanical PE Exam Prep. If you'd like to be notified when I post new videos, go ahead and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And if you want to get the basics down before solving lots of problems, take my Udemy course, HVAC and Refrigeration Fundamentals. In less than five hours, you'll review all the major topics you need for the PE exam. By the end, you'll actually be excited to start studying. Next, they wanted to know what's the tonnage of the refrigeration effect. So what we just dealt with in terms of change in the humidity ratio really only speaks to the latent cooling that's happened. Now they're asking the tonnage of the refrigeration effect, which includes in its entirety the net cooling. In this case, we have latent cooling and sensible cooling. The net cooling is captured by the change in enthalpy. So we're going to do a very similar calculation, but instead of using delta omega, we're going to use delta H. So let's set that up for the refrigeration effect. So now the formula we'll use will be Q dot, and this is Q dot total, because like we said, it includes sensible and latent, it's gonna be based on delta H, is the mass flow rate of air times H1 minus H2. And the mass flow rate of air term is gonna look very similar, it's the exact same term as we had above. Let's show it all again for completeness. So that's 8,000 cubic feet per minute times the 60 minutes per hour divided by the specific volume 13.84 cubic feet per pound and we lose minutes and we lose cubic feet and then we're multiplying by the difference of those two enthalpies that we looked up before H1 was 31.18 BTU per pound and H2 is 24.43 and if you're using the psych chart I don't expect you to have the same level of precision you're not going to have a hundredths place you'd be lucky to get the tenths place correct just using the chart you'll probably be getting it to the closest 0.2 or maybe even the closest 0.5 and that's fine for most problems you shouldn't need that high of a level of precision so if you do this on your own and you come up with an answer that's within five percent that's probably fine and so when we run those numbers we get a total refrigeration effect of 234,100 and what's the units on that we're gonna have pounds of dry air canceling with this pounds of dry air and we should have BTUs per hour but the way the question was phrased, they wanted us to find the tonnage. So that means they want the answer in refrigeration tons. BTUs per hour is a perfectly good energy unit, but they re requested tons. So there are 12,000 BTUs per hour per ton. So we can divide by 12,000 and we'll get the tons. The answer is 19.5 tons. And that's the answer to B. And lastly, they wanted us to find the flow rate in GPM of the chilled water. So as this air is getting cooled, the water is heating up. It's being supplied at 42 and returned at 55. So there's this delta T of about 13 degrees. And we know how much energy has to be absorbed by the water. It's the same amount of energy that was removed from the air side. It has to be transferred into the water side. So what we just found that refrigeration effect in BTUs per hour or tons, however you prefer to think about it, that energy has to balance. Energy in equals energy out. So let's write an equation for the chill water flow rate. There's a handy rule of thumb that we can use, which says Q dot equals 500 times GPM times delta T. This is sort of the water side equivalent of 1.08 CFM delta T, which is often used for sensible heating or cooling on the air side. This is a similar rule of thumb that gives you the flow rate in GPM provided the total heat transfer in BTUs per hour. So that's critical. The units for Q dot have to be in BTUs per hour for this to work. And delta T has to be in degrees Fahrenheit. So we can pretty much apply this directly. Let's just solve for GPM. It's going to be Q dot over 500 and delta T. So Q dot was 234,100. And I'm not going to write the units because this is a rule of thumb, so it's already working out the units for us. As long as we put the right units in, we'll get the right units out. We divide by 500, and we divide by the delta T, which was 55 minus 42, which is 13, and we get 36 GPM. And that is answer C. Now, if you don't like rules of thumb, which I don't know why you wouldn't, it's so quick and easy, but some people like to see the units cancel, and that's the only way they're going to be confident that they've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. 
then you can certainly do it in a slightly longer way, which in some cases you may have to, like on the air side, you can't always use 1.08 CFM delta T because the density is baked into that 1.08 number. And if the density is not close to that assumed density, it'll throw your answer off. But in this case, we're dealing with liquid water and the density doesn't change very much through a pretty wide range of temperatures for liquid water. This water is going between 55 and 42 degrees. It's pretty much stable at 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So you really can pretty much trust this rule of thumb. But regardless, let's look at an alternative. Where this rule of thumb comes from is a formula that you probably remember from chemistry class. It's the first time I ever saw this formula. MCP delta T, the mass flow rate times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. Where the mass flow rate, m dot, is the density times the volume flow rate. So we can make that substitution into the formula. And now this becomes density times V dot times specific heat capacity times delta T. And now if we algebraically rearrange this to get the volume flow rate by itself, then it becomes Q dot over density, specific heat capacity, and delta T. And now let's make substitutions where we include the units. So 234,100 BTUs per hour. And the density of liquid water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And the specific heat capacity of liquid water in US customary units is one BTU per pound degree Fahrenheit. So it takes one BTU to change the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. You should definitely remember that. And then the delta T we said was 55 minus 42. I'll just say that's 13 degrees Fahrenheit. And now we can see all the units cancel. Degrees Fahrenheit goes away, pounds goes away, BTUs goes away, and we end up with cubic feet per hour, which is not what we want. We want GPM. But let's get that answer anyway. I'll put it down here. That works out to 288.6 cubic feet per hour. And now we have to change that. So one hour is 60 minutes. That gets rid of hours. And what's bigger, a cubic foot or a gallon? A cubic foot is bigger. You could pour multiple gallons into one cubic foot. So we put one cubic foot here. That gets rid of cubic feet. And how many gallons can you pour into a cubic foot? P picture a cube that's one foot on each side and literally picture pouring a gallon of milk into it. How many times could you pour a gallon of milk into it? Turns out the answer is 7.48 times, and that's gallons. So the final answer is, again, 36 GPM, confirms the rule of thumb, and we have gallons per minute.